back on it now, I, I think that gave me the motivation to actually look at the evidence and just see where I, I thought it pointed. I realized that this was bigger than any one person or discipline, and this was the beginning of a community of scientists who were now willing to face the fundamental mystery of life's origin. sometimes wonder why anybody talks about anything else because this is the most interesting topic there is where do we come from how did we get here what brought us into existence what is our relationship to reality as a whole you look at the incredible diversity and complexity of life and inevitably the question arises what brought all this into existence was it simply chance and necessity undirected natural forces or is there something else going on is there a purpose, a plan, a design, a design due to an intelligent cause? I think that is the fundamental question. In the 19th century when Darwin was alive, scientists thought that the basis of life, the cell, was some simple glob of protoplasm, like a little piece of jello or something that was not hard to explain at all. This perception didn't really change too much until the early 1950s, but in the last half century, our knowledge of the cell has just exploded. Today, powerful technologies reveal elaborate microscopic worlds. Worlds so small that a thimbleful of cultured liquid can contain more than four billion single-cell bacteria each packed with circuits, assembly instructions, and miniature machines, the complexity of which Charles Darwin could never have imagined. At the very basis of life, where molecules and cells run the show, we've discovered machines, literally molecular machines. There are little molecular trucks that carry supplies from one end of the cell to the other. There are machines which capture the energy from sunlight and turn it into usable energy. There are as many molecular machines in the human body as there are functions that the body has to do. So if you think about hearing, seeing, smelling, tasting, feeling, blood clotting, respiratory action, the immune response, all of those require a host of machines. When we look at these machines, we ask ourselves, where do they come from? And the standard answer, Darwinian evolution, uh, is very inadequate in my view. In 1996, Michael Behe published a book titled Darwin's Black Box. In it, he argued that natural selection, Darwin's designer substitute, could not explain the origin of the bacterial flagellum or any other irreducibly complex biological system. Instead, Behe concluded that the integrated complexity of these systems pointed to intelligent design. There are really two big questions in biology. How do you get new living forms with new structures like wings and eyes from life that already exists? And secondly, how did life originate on Earth in the first place? Now, of course, we know that Darwin spent most of his life formulating an answer to the first of these two questions. Charles Darwin compared the history of life on Earth to a great branching tree. The base of the tree represented the very first living cell, and the branches were new and more complex life forms that had evolved over time from the first primitive organism. 
Darwin was trying to explain how the branches on the tree of life originated. He was trying to show how natural selection could have modified existing organisms to produce the great diversity of plant and animal life that fills the earth today. But when it came to the base of the tree, which represented the origin of the first life, the first living cell, Darwin had very little to say. In fact, in The Origin of Species, he didn't even address the question of how life might have originated from non-living matter. Chance, natural selection, and his own theory of self-organization had all failed to explain the origin of genetic information. Now Kenyon saw only one alternative. We have not the slightest chance of a chemical evolutionary origin for even the simplest uh, of cells. So the concept of the intelligent design of life was immensely attractive to me and made a great deal of sense as it very closely matched the multiple discoveries in molecular biology. When I look at molecular machines or the incredibly complex process by which cells divide, I want to ask, is it possible that these things had an intelligence behind them, that there was a plan or a purpose to this structure? Science ought to be a search for the truth about the world. Now, we shouldn't prejudge what might be true. We shouldn't say, I don't like that explanation, so I'm going to put it to one side. Rather, when we come to a puzzle in nature, we ought to bring to that puzzle every possible cause that might explain it. One of the problems I have with evolutionary theory is it artificially rules out a kind of cause even before the evidence has a chance to speak. And the cause that's ruled out is intelligence. Since the late 19th century, since the time of Darwin, in fact, in part because of Darwin's writing in The Origin of Species, scientists came to con accept a convention, a definition of science that excluded the possibility of design as a scientific explanation. And that convention has a name. It's called methodological naturalism. Recently, in a book titled The Design Inference, mathematician William Dembski has made an important breakthrough in understanding design reasoning. Dembski has identified the specific features of artifacts that cause us to recognize prior intelligent activity. I came to this by trying to look at how do we reason about design? What, what are the logical moves that we have to go through in order to come to a conclusion of design? So what I'm trying to do is to establish reliable, empirical, scientifically rigorous criteria for deciding whether something is in fact designed. So I was looking at the logic of it. And what I found was you need improbability and you need specification, the right sort of pattern, these objective patterns. According to Dembski, human beings correctly detect the activity of intelligence whenever they observe a highly improbable object or event that also matches a recognizable pattern. Just such a pattern is found in the Black Hills of South Dakota. If you travel through the West, you'll see lots of different shapes on mountainsides, most of which mean nothing at all. They're just rocks strewn in various patterns. But what you don't see are the faces of Lincoln, Jefferson, Teddy Roosevelt, and George Washington on mountainsides. The only place you see that is in South Dakota. And the reason it's there is because a sculptor, an eccentric sculptor, decided that he wanted to honor these presidents by spending the larger part of his life chiseling their faces in the side of that mountain. That pattern is improbable. A random hillside is also improbable, but a random hillside doesn't specify anything. We do know, though, that there were four guys who were presidents of the United States who had particular patterns with their faces, and those patterns on the mountainside in South Dakota match faces elsewhere. If I look up and see the faces, I immediately recognize that they match the faces of the four presidents that are known from money or portraits at the National Gallery or paintings and books. And, and so I realize when I look at Mount Rushmore, we have not only a highly improbable configuration of rock, but one which matches an independently given pattern that reliably indicates intelligence. So we have a small probability, specification, it's design.
So you need complexity or improbability, lots of prime numbers, and you also need a pattern. And it has to be the right sort of pattern. It's not a pattern that you're imposing. It's a pattern that's there objectively. Scientists have discovered a wealth of information within the nucleus of the living cell. DNA has a structure that is ideal for carrying more efficiently than the DNA molecule. A full complement of human DNA has three billion individual characters. Analysis of the DNA molecule's coding regions show that its chemical characters have a specific arrangement that allows them to convey detailed instructions or information, much like letters in a meaningful sentence or binary digits in a computer code. Everything we know in our experience suggests that information-rich systems arise from intelligent design. But what do we make of the fact that there is information in life, in every living cell of every living organism? That's the fundamental mystery. Where does that information come from? We can infer that an intelligence played a role in the origin of that system, even if we weren't there to observe the system coming into existence. Meyer's work on the origin of genetic information is now part of a comprehensive scientific case for design that grew out of a meeting of scientists and philosophers on the central coast of California in 1993. Their objective was to reassess an idea that had dominated biology for more than a century. In the process, they gave birth to a theory that has become known as intelligent design. To me, the great promise of design is it gives us a new tool and explanation that belongs in the toolkit of science. Intelligent causes are real. They leave evidence of their existence. And a healthy science is a science that seeks the truth and lets the evidence speak for itself. The argument for intelligent design is based on observation of the facts. Now, that's my definition of good science. It's observation of the facts. Now, when you observe the facts, as Michael Behe has done, what do you observe? You observe this incredible pattern of interrelated complexity. And the way we conclude intelligent design for the bacterial flagellum is the same way we conclude intelligent design for an outboard motor. When we see an outboard motor, we see the way the parts interact and, and so on. We know somebody made that. Uh, the reasoning is the same for biological uh, machines. So the idea of intelligent design is a completely scientific one. Certainly it, it might have religious implications, but it does not depend on religious premises. When I look at the evidence objectively, without ruling out the possibility of design, design just leaps up as the most likely explanation. And that's why I believe that it's true. I think design is back on the table. You know, we can't explain these systems by natural law. And if we're searching for truth, and they are in fact designed, if we have to be design engineers to understand them, then I say, what's the problem? You know, you go where the data leads you. And the implications, yeah, they have profound metaphysical impl implications, but so be it. So it's a powerful idea that the universe is rational and comprehensible, underwritten by a supreme intelligence that meant for this world to be understood, is something that underwrites then the program of science, because then you can go out and look at the world and the world will make sense. If it's all just a chaotic assemblage, there's no reason to expect any rationality out there. But if it in fact is the product of a mind, then you can go out and science becomes this enormous, wonderful puzzle-solving project in which you can expect to find rationality and beauty and comprehensibility right at the foundation of things.